Well, thank you for the warm welcome. And it is warm, isn't it? <laughs> Reminds me of back home in Louisiana almost, except the humidity doesn't equal the uh, temperature. So uh, we're still ahead of that game. By the way, the speaker who was here last month was Dr. Patton, Don Patton. He just came back from an Israel trip about two weeks ago and found out he had a little heart problem, had had some stints put in. So we keep him in prayer. I think he's doing well. I didn't have a chance to speak with him. But the other speaker, Dave Prentice, told me about it yesterday in a phone conversation because Dave went on a trip with him. So, uh, so I think Don's doing well, but you know, keep him, keep him in prayer so that uh, the evil one doesn't take him out of the game. That's the important thing. So what we're going to do this evening, hopefully, is give you some information as best I can present it in an uh, understandable way because a lot of aspects of this problem get into the technical uh, domain of uh, treating with the physics and, and so on. And I'm going to try to gloss over that as much as possible. So uh, I, I hope I'm successful in doing that for you. And if you find that I'm, I'm losing you, please let me know. I'd rather know that you're getting lost than to let you stay lost, you know what I mean? So uh, let's uh, move on ahead with this. What accelerated decay rates is the issue that we want to deal with. Can decay rates change? And that's the, uh, the question. Uh, when we speak of accelerated decay rates, we're speaking of a time frame. Uh, in fact, decay rates depend upon measuring by some technique a radioactive decay mechanism. That's the kind of decay we're talking about. So it, it's a time frame, and we're using the amount of radioactive decay that has changed, say, over a given function of time, uh, which is called the rate. Any change with time is called the rate. And so we call that the uh, interval over which the time has spanned for that amount of radioactive decay to be measured. It's kind of like this hourglass that you see up here on the screen, which uh, if you see this little hourglass up here, and uh, right there, it's barely on the screen, but it's there. And you know, an hourglass just has what, sand or whatever. So you want to measure an hour? Well, you watch the sand fall through that top uh, component all the way down to the bottom, and one hour has passed, right? If half of it has been moved, half an hour has passed. If a fourth of it has been moved, a quarter of an hour has passed, etc. So this is kind of the thing we're dealing with when we talk about decay rates. So I kind of explained to you what radioactive decay was already, but where does it come from? It comes from the nature of the elements, the chemical elements, the atomic structure, uh, of those elements. This is a little bit too far over, but I don't know if we can straighten that out right now. Anyway, every, every atom uh, has its own unique properties. And uh, those properties determine the kind of atom that it is. And of course, one of the properties that determines an atom is called its atomic number. Another property is its atomic mass. So every atom has a specific atomic number that distinguishes it from another atom. That happens to be the number of protons that are in the nucleus of that atom. That's what that atomic number is. The mass comes from the protons and neutrons that add to the nucleus as well. So the mass can change without the nature or the atomic number changing. And therefore, since the mass can change, we call those different masses isotopes. So the isotopes of any element having a nuclear instability, there are certain rules for instability, that causes that nucleus to be unstable and it changes. It emanates some energy and maybe releases some particles in the process as a rule, and that's called the decay process. So it changes into some other isotope. What kind of other isotope? Well, it depends upon the nature of the change. But ultimately, it's going to end up with an isotope that doesn't change anymore, which we say is stable. It's ultimately attained. Now, the time for that process, of course, 
is measured in terms of what we call the decay half-life. And it's important that we at least understand why we use half-life, because we can't ever measure the exact amount of original radioactivity in, in any substance that unless we did it in the laboratory and were able to follow it through on a time clock step for step. But the ages over which they're talking about in the geological sense are supposedly very long ages. You know, some of these half-lives have billions of years in time. So you measure the amount it takes for half an amount of that material to change or to decay, and that's called its half-life. And then another half, that's another half-life. And another half, another half-life. And so it goes. So each interval of change is measured as a uh, half-life from one to the other. And hopefully, we'll say this. If you look at it this way, uh, we look at what we call the parent atoms, which are the original ones that are decaying. That's on the blue curve here. And the daughter atoms, or the daughter nuclei, those are the ones that are being changed, are the products of the decay. And that's that red line here. Well, you see, in time, but depending on the number of half-lives, the blue, which is the parent atoms, they're losing, of course, going down, 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 because they're being depleted, naturally. You're losing that material. At that time, in the same time frame of rate of change, the daughter products are increasing. And of course, when they've reached this interval right here, this intersection point, that's the point at which the rate of change of decreasing the parent, rate of change of increasing the daughters, is exactly the same, and that would be exactly one half-life, you see, at that point. Okay, what will affect this change? Oh. Another technical problem, huh? Yeah. I don't know, Brian. <laughs> it's, it's on my screen. <laughs> I think it's off. Yeah. I don't know. It's not my equipment. Okay. There it is. We're in the countdown now, so. There we go. Okay, let's hope this continues in a good way. <laughs> so what affects these decay rates? In other words, can they change? That's once one of the things we have to consider, right? Uh, the progress of, uh, of the decay process in time, of course, we said was the measure of the decay rate, wasn't it? And of course, that's the thing that we're looking at. What is that actual mechanism causing that to happen? And can that mechanism be altered? Uh, the selecting a radioactive isotope, uh, if we subject it to an environment where there's extensive amount of energy, enough to interact with the energy in the nucleus of the atom, then it will cause the decay rate to be accelerated. Now, we're talking about very a lot, a lot of energy, an enormous amount of energy, but the question is, is it possible for that to happen? Okay, well, in the process, as we discuss it, the nucleus of the radioactive isotope 
will emit one or more particles, and usually it's either called an alpha particle or a beta particle, by and large, or sometimes it's a positron. Now, uh, alpha particles are not defined here, but if you took a helium atom and you stripped all its electrons away, both of them, there's only two, uh, you would have the helium nucleus, which is an alpha particle. Uh, a beta particle is simply an electron, an electron that comes out of the nucleus. And the positron is the so-called antiparticle of the electron, which is the positively charged electron, the positron. Okay, so these are the main ones that are released in radioactive decay. Uh, sometimes there's other things that happen once in a while, but by and large, it's restricted to these three types of particles. So they will cause that parent isotope to be transformed into a new daughter isotope. Okay? So here it is. Energy is being given off in the process. Of course, radiation is always happening because energy is changing. So you're going to have radiation. And then, of course, the particles are coming out at a certain accelerated rate. And that's the whole mechanism of that decay process. So if you imagine all of this going on as each little nucleus of each atom is subjected to its environment, then all these processes are happening, and then those processes can be affected by the environment. Here's some examples of decay changes. For example, uranium-238, that's this one here, isotope number 238, it has a four and a half billion year half-life as determined indirectly in the laboratory. Nobody sat around, naturally, for four and a half billion years trying to watch that half-life, right? I know I'm pretty old, but I haven't quite gotten that old yet. But uh, that's a, what they call an extrapolation process, and they usually extrapolate it in terms of the energy. So each decay process has a finite amount of energy, and as that energy changes with decay, that's how they get these half-lives. Okay, there's a helium nucleus, which is an alpha particle, and electrons, which are coming off, which are beta particles, and then uh, you end up finally, after quite a few unstable isotopes down the line, you end up with a stable isotope of lead, uh, number 206. Uranium-235, a different isotope of uranium, undergoes a similar decay. It's a little bit shorter, 0.71 or 0.713, billion years for its half-life. And that also gives alpha particles, the helium nuclei, the electrons, which are the beta particles. And it ends up with another lead isotope, 207. Okay, here's a thorium, which is an element that's close to uranium. Thorium-232, it's got an extremely long half-life, 13 billion years. We're getting almost to the limits of the age of the universe with this half-life as far as evolutionists say, right? 13 billion years, that's way out there. Again, helium nuclei, beta particles, a new uh, lead isotope, 209, being formed. And then here's another, the last example here is polonium, 241. It's got a reasonably short half-life compared to these 2.4 million years. And that undergoes the same kind of transition, helium nuclei, which are alpha particles, beta particles, and polonium goes to bismuth, 209. So these are simply examples of different characteristic isotopes. And an isotope decay rate, or its half-life, can be oh, enormously different from one type of isotope to another. We can have these long half-lives like we have here in the billions and millions of years, or we can have them in the microseconds or the nanoseconds, extremely short half-lives. So it varies all over the map, depending upon the type of nucleus. Now, how do we radiometric date? Well, first of all, we have some assumptions. The first assumption is no radioactive daughter product elements would be present at the start. Because if that were true, and we're measuring how much is there as a, uh, an indicator of the decay process, then we'll be messed up to begin with, right? Okay. So that's very important that no daughters were present at the start. Number two, no loss or gain of any daughter or parent, either one, in the process. In other words, if there's anything that could happen 
by a physical change in the environment of that decay process over the period of time in which it's supposed to happen that could change the amount of elements as either daughter or parent elements in the ratios that they were originally, then we would have a problem. The assumptions would have to be true, these assumptions, or else we'd have a problem. Very important, the decay rate has to be constant, otherwise we have no way of knowing how to measure the beginning and the end with any degree of reliability, because we have, we have no way of doing that. This is what we're keying on today, the measurement of the decay rate. These other matters, they have been dealt with in detail by a number of investigators. They've been reported in depth by the uh, rate project of ICR. If you have any of those proceedings, uh, those books, you may want to look at that. And they have numerous uh, uh, amounts of uh, evidence to show that there's no reason to believe that either this condition nor this condition could even be valid at any time in the history of the Earth. Okay? So we're going to address the constancy of decay rates. Now, what are some of the examples that we have to deal with? Well, we have, for example, from volcanic ash. We have potassium argon dating, where potassium, I'll show you later in more detail, but a potassium isotope 40 decays to two things. It decays to calcium and it decays to argon. Well, argon's a gas, and that's the one that they key on because it's the one that they can determine in at least hopefully presume that the conditions that are necessary will be met. Because if they try to use calcium, there's calcium all around in those rocks, and they'll never have any chance of using the calcium as a measurement index. Mount St. Helens, when did that happen? 1986 was the top of the uh, action there. Guess what those rocks dated? 0.35 to 2.8 million years. Pretty bad, I'd say. Kilea, Hawaiian volcano, a little less than 200 years ago, from zero to 22 million years. Some of them are zero because they couldn't date them with any reliability. But they went all the way up to 22 million years, certainly much, much older than 200 years, right? Uh, Hilolea, which is, of course, known between 1800 and 1801, that went from 160 million to 3.3 billion years in dating the volcanic ash from those rocks. So these are the references from which this data is obtained. You can check them out if you want. And there are numerous other references that would also attest to that. Now, here's a statement made by Stanfield. And it's a very important statement because he's an evolutionist. And notice what he says. It is obvious that the radiometric techniques may not be the absolute dating methods they are claimed to be. And age estimates on a given geological stratum by different radiometric methods are often quite different, sometimes by hundreds of millions of years. Absolutely. Very definitely. In fact, most of the time, depending upon which samples you use, if you don't selectively isolate your samples to fall in all in the same range, and you just do ramble sampling by any kind of randomness, 